watching this play in the early morning. And then you would watch three plays of tragedy and then a Seder play at the end of the day, and it would be near evening when all of this was finally over. The genius of Aeschylus is that he actually will frame this whole play, this series of plays, this trilogy. Beginning in the early morning, we're going to have a watchman looking out. You know, he's watched through the evening. Okay, And at the end of the third text, the Furies, we'll actually have a procession, candlelight procession, that's being led off as evening is coming on. Okay? Without question, one of the greatest examples of trilogy, the only extant trilogy that we have, actually. Um, and so we'll pay attention to it. Where are we? We are in Argos, which is in Greece. And we have a watchman, and he sees the light, which will mean Troy has fallen. By the way, put it in your notes that we will, with the watchman and with the herald, who will come later in our play, um, Aeschylus will be uh, sh sharing with us the importance of some of minor characters, but they play kind of pivotal roles, all right? Um, we then have the chorus, the old men, each leaning on his staff, we're told. So you got the old men who will show up, and the importance of the chorus, I talked about it in an earlier, in an earlier lecture. And they begin to talk, <clears throat> and very quickly they get to the story of the death of the sacrifice of Iphigenia, and the ways in which, because Artemis ordered it, right, this could redound negatively on Argos. In other words, let's put it in our notes this way. The chorus have a premonition that something bad may happen when Agamemnon comes home. Of course, we, we call that foreshadowing, right? And there's no question, Aeschylus wants his audience to already be thinking about what's it going to be like when Agamemnon comes home to meet Clytemnestra. This is going to be, by the way, let's point it out, a series of plays in which individuals in the plays are forced with what we will call moral dilemmas. Write that down and then we'll kind of define it. Moral dilemmas. Choices where it seems like they don't have a good resolution. You can almost think about Hegel's philosophy as we've talked about it, where you have your thesis, your, your exact opposite, your antithesis, and then there's some dialectic or tension between the two to produce your synthesis. Well, we're going to see this over and over again in these plays. For example, Agamemnon needs to go to war and fight against the Trojans because Helen has been taken. Agamemnon is told the only way that's going to happen is to kill his own daughter, sacrifice his own daughter, Iphigenia. But wait, you're supposed to, as a daddy, take care of your daughters. You're not supposed to sacrifice them. Yeah, but the gods said you're supposed to. So who's at fault? This will be one of those kinds of examples that we are speaking about. All right, And we're going to have these kinds of moral dilemmas all the way through these plays. We'll be pointing them out as we go. Okay? Clytemnestra arrives <clears throat> for the first time, and her first words as she comes onto the stage is to say, um, Troy is ours. And she's really, really excited about that, because for her, she'll begin by saying, As saith the adage, from the womb of night spring forth with promise fair, the young child light. Note the irony that the word child gets used right away because later she will say, Clytemnestra will say, the reason I killed Agamemnon was because he murdered my child, right? Ah, fairer even than all hope, my news. By Grecian hands is Priam's city taken. In other words, I'm so happy that the city of Troy is fallen. Of course, the irony is that the reason she's happy is because now this means her husband, Agamemnon, will be coming home, which allows her to exact the vengeance that she wants to exact, along with her lover, Aegis, right? We then will have a herald who will arrive to say, not only is it true that Troy has fallen, Agamemnon will soon be home. And it will then uh, lead to Clytemnestra having some, some observations <clears throat> as she comes on stage as the herald is talking. She says, all is fulfilled. I spare your longer tale. She's speaking now to the chorus. The king himself, Anon, shall tell me all. In other words, I don't need to hear a long story because Agamemnon is coming home and he's going to tell me everything I need to know. The irony, of course, is going to run deep. She says, this to my husband, this is her hope, that he tarry not, but turn the city's longing into joy. Yea, let him come, and coming may he find a wife no other than he left her, true and faithful as a watchdog to his home. Whoa, 
She will even suggest, I haven't been messing around. Of course, we're going to find out that in fact, yeah, she has been messing around, but so has Daddy, so has Agamemnon. He's also been messing around, okay? Well, Agamemnon does arrive. He's in a chariot and is and it is side the beautiful Cassandra, right? Now, there's two important things right away that Agamemnon will say. Uh, one is, he says, we need to thank the gods for victory to show that he's pious, in other words. The second is, we need to cleanse the city of any corruption that maybe has happened. Of course, the irony of all ironies is that, yeah, the only cleansing that's going to get done is by Clytemnestra herself. Now, <clears throat> when, when uh, Agamemnon shows up in his chariot, this is, of course, a powerful moment. Everybody that knows this story knows that sooner or later Agamemnon's coming face to face with his wife Clytemnestra, <coughs> which begs the obvious question, how is Clytemnestra going to first of all set up, and that's the term, let's write it in our notes, set up her guy? The way she does it is brilliant. Aeschylus, brilliant, brilliant Greek here. Uh, and sometimes hard to translate because Aeschylus played games himself with inventing. Like Shakespeare did in English, Aeschylus did in Greek. So he invented some words that are sometimes hard to translate. But we got some fun language here. She says, old men of Argos, lieges of our realm. This is, again, Clytemnestra speaking. Shame shall not bid me shrink lest ye should see the love I bear, my lord. I'm so, I'm so in love with this man. I'm so happy he's home. Such blushing fear dies at the last from hearts of humankind. From mine own soul and from no alien lips I know and will reveal the life I bore, reluctant through the lingering live-long years, the while my lord beleaguered Aelian's wall. In other words, when my husband was away fighting at the walls of Troy, I lived the most horrific of lives. She continues, first, that a wife sat sundered from her lord in widowed solitude was utter woe. And woe to hear how rumors many tongues all boded evil. She said, I heard lots of rumors that came back from Troy. <laughs> of course, we know because we've read the Iliad what some of those rumors might have been, like, for example, that Agamemnon and Achilles were fighting over a girl, for example. Woe when he who came and he who followed spoke of ill on ill, keening, lost, lost, all lost, through hall and bower. Had this my husband met so many wounds, as by a thousand channels rumor told, no network e'er was full of holes as he, had he been slain, as oft as tidings came that he was dead. In other words, I was so worried that he might die. Now, let's just put it in our notes, the dark irony here, the reason why. She was so upset that he might die in battle as she would not have the chance to exact revenge on her husband for killing their daughter, sacrificing their daughter, Iphigenia, right? She says, oft for self-slaughter had I slung the noose. I often considered suicide. But others wrenched it from my neck away. Hence, haps, it that Orestes, thine and mine, the pledge and symbol of our wedded troth, stands not beside us now as he should stand, nor marvel thou at this. He dwells with one who guards him loyally. Um, she says, you know, I, I even had to send my own son away. I didn't get to watch Orestes grow up because I was so worried that something might happen and I would lose my son Orestes. Of course, we'll find out later. No, she sent away her son Orestes. <clears throat> she kept her daughter Electra. She sent away her son Orestes so that she could begin plotting the killing of Agamemnon, the very thing we're about to see. She continues, If I slept, night after night, she says, I was unkindled. If I slept, each sound, the tiny humming of a gnat roused me again, again from fitful dreams, wherein I felt the smitten, saw the slain, thrice for each moment of my hour of sleep. All this, she says, I bore. And now, released from woe, I hail my Lord as Watchdog of a fold, this saving stay, stay rope of a storm-tossed ship, this column stout that holds the roof aloft, his only child unto a sire bereaved. Notice all of these asses, right? Uh, these similes that just keep building, right? As land beheld past hope, 
by crews forlorn, as sunshine fair when tempest's wrath is past, is gushing spring to thirsty wayfarer, so sweet it is to escape the press of pain. With such salute, I bid my husband hail. She says, I can't even use language to describe how happy I am that you're home. You have no idea what I want to do to your body. And of course, Agamemnon, so pleased, right, that now he's home. It's good to be king and all of that, right? For long and hard, I bore that ire of old. You don't have any idea, she says, how hard it's been for me, the ten years of waiting for you to come home. Sweet Lord, step forth, step from thy car, I pray. Nay, not on earth plant the proud foot, O king, that trod down Troy. Women, why tarry ye, whose task it is to spread your monarch's path with tapestry? Swift, swift, with purple strew his passage fair, that justice lead him to a home at last he scarcely looked to see. He hasn't even looked to see um, that he is home, in other words. She seems to suggest that he's maybe a little bit arrogant. Notice the word proud gets used here, proud foot. She has women lay out purple tapestry. Okay, and already we're beginning to see the power of the symbol of the net. She's laying her, her net for her trap, if you will, right? For what remains, zeal unsubdued by sleep shall nerve my hand to work as right and as the gods command. In other words, I've got some business i got to do on you, and I hope I have the courage to do it, and I hope the gods let it happen. She literally comes right out and basically tells Agamemnon what she's about to do. Of course, stupid guy, he's got no idea what's about to happen to him. And his very first words to her are, in fact, um, to speak with a certain kind of arrogance. Um, <clears throat> and he will say it, you know what, strew not this purple that shall make each step an arrogance. I don't want to walk on the purple that you've laid out for me. Such pomp beseems the gods, not me, a mortal man, to set his foot on these rich dyes. I hold such pride and fear, and bid thee honor me as man, not God. Um, uh, that is to say, um, I, I'm not going to walk. No, it's bad form, not going to do it. Now, Clytemnestra is brilliant. And let's put it in our notes already at 3A. We have often asked the question, where does Shakespeare get his motivation for Lady Macbeth? She is brilliant. Although, hey, she is brilliant. In Act One of Macbeth, that final seven scene, when she's able to twist Macbeth to get him to do what she wants him to do, we're going to see all of that constructed from Clytemnestra. She's brilliant. So her man has said, no, 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 I'm not walking on that purple stuff because that's an offense to the gods. It suggests pride and arrogance. Clytemnestra, <clears throat> she says, no, unsay it, she says, for not Thou, my will, in other words, don't go against what I'm suggesting here. Agamemnon responds, no, I have said it, <clears throat> and will not mar my word. Clytemnestra, was it fear made this meekness to the gods? Oh, my little man, I thought you were a hero and brave and courageous, and now you're worried about offending the gods? Notice Agamemnon, if cause be cause, tis mine for this resolve. Clytemnestra, what thinkest thou in thy place had Priam done? It's an interesting question. If Priam had won the war, don't you think he probably would have walked on purple robes, purple the color of, of royalty? Don't you think he would have? Agamemnon. It's a, by the way, when we, in, in our lecture on LearnStraw.net, you can find this lecture in the senior folder on Macbeth. When Lady Macbeth is able to jack her husband, Macbeth. How does she do it? Rhetorical questions. Brilliant questions. This is a brilliant question. If Priam had won, would he have walked on purple? Agamemnon. He surely would have walked on broidered robes. Now the word robes here and the, and the net and all of this is brilliantly crafted. Frescoes. Clytemnestra returns. Then fear not thou the voice of human blame. Don't be afraid, in other words. Agamemnon says, yet mightier is the murmur of a crowd. She says, shrink not from envy, a penage of bliss. Agamemnon says, war is not woman's part, nor war of words. In other words, 
women should not be allowed to be participants in war. All they're good at is talking. The ironies run deep here because obviously she is setting him up. She comes back, yet yeah, happy victors well may yield therein. Then Agamemnon will ask the question, does crave for triumph in this pretty strife? Clytemnestra will say it, yield, give in, of thy grace, permit me to prevail. Then he will, Agamemnon, remove his sandals, he will walk on the purple, and he will say, I pray, let none among the gods look down with jealous eye on me. And um, he will then walk into the, uh, into the, uh, the, the, the uh, castle, saying to Cassandra, uh, uh, I'm sorry, to Clytemnestra, hey, will you take care of this new girl that's my prize, Cassandra, will you take care of her as well? Be nice to her, take care of her. And you can just see that Clytemnestra's like, oh yeah, sure, I'll, I, you bet, I'll take care of the both of you. Immediately the chorus will express the fears that obviously the audience has as well. Something is fundamentally wrong. We then have a very interesting scene. Clytemnestra will return, and she will walk up to Cassandra, who's been standing. She has not moved. She has not said a word. And she will say to Cassandra, get in there. Get into the castle. Cassandra will not move. She will not respond. Clytemnestra makes some suggestions <clears throat> that maybe it's because Cassandra can't understand what she's saying. And then ultimately, Clytemnestra will go back into the castle, leaving Cassandra alone on stage with the chorus. Now, for many viewers and students of this play, Cassandra is the most interesting character of this play. And many have argued, far more interesting than Agamemnon or Clytemnestra, is Cassandra, <clears throat> who is in every way tragic through and through. She has done absolutely nothing to deserve what is about to happen to her. And she knows what is about to happen to her. Her very first words are actually more like howls. We think of Allen Ginsberg's great poem, Howl. They're almost like howls. Woe, woe, alas, earth, mother earth, and thou, Apollo, Apollo. The chorus will say, peace, shriek not to the bright prophetic God. Right? Cassandra will then say it, Apollo, Apollo, God of all ways, but only deaths to me. Once and again, O thou, destroyer named, thou hast destroyed me, thou, my love of old. She continues um, as she begins to see things, right? She begins to prophesy. And she says, God, a new sight, a net, a snare of hell, set by her hand, talking about Clytemnestra, herself a snare more fell, a wedded wife, she slays her lord, helped by another hand, each time she makes this observation, um, that the chorus is like, what? What are you talking about? Ye powers whose hate of Atreus' home no blood can satiate, raise the wild cry above the sacrifice abhorred, the sacrifice of Iphigenia, of course, right? Cassandra will then continue by saying, ah, well a day, the cup of agony whereof I chant foams with a drought for me, Ah, Lord, ah, leader, thou hast led me here, was but to die with thee whose doom is near. She recognizes two things for your notes. One, Agamemnon is about to get jacked. Two, she will go down with him for nothing she's done. I mean, think about this. When the city of Troy falls, right, Cassandra runs to the temple and grabs hold of the idol there, the, the statue of the god. And the rules are, a young girl doing that is supposed to be left alone. And the great Greek warrior Ajax comes in and will rape her right there in the temple. Then poor Cassandra is lined up with all the other women. Then Agamemnon throws her on his ship and brings her home. And now she is about ready to be killed by Agamemnon's wife. Clytemnestra. In other words, the epitome of tragic. Many have said, 
that in Cassandra you see the form of the early workings of Shakespeare's creation of some of his most tragic women, especially Ophelia, comes to mind. Finally, Cassandra will finish by saying, <clears throat> Woe for my city, woe for Elian's fall. Father, how oft with sanguine stains steamed on thine altar stone the, the blood of cattle slain, that heaven might guard our wall. In other words, her dad, Priam, he, he offered up many sacrifices to keep the fall of Troy from happening. But all was shed in vain. Lo, lie the shattered towers whereas they fell. And I, ah, burning heart, shall soon lie low as well. And in the process then, the realization is that Cassandra knows that it's all going to be over. She does prophesy, however, in this long speech that maybe, maybe there will be some help coming, right? She says, Yet shall the gods have heed of me who die, for by their will shall one requite my doom. He, to avenge his father's blood outpoured, shall smite and slay with matricidal hand. Orestes will kill his own mother, matricide. Ah, he shall come. Though far away he roam a banished wanderer in a stranger's land to crown his kindred's edifice of ill, called home to vengeance by his father's fall. Thus have the high gods sworn and shall fulfill. So already looking forward to the second of the three plays, The Libation Bearers, Cassandra says it. After I die, along with Agamemnon, Orestes will come home and there will be justice for what is about to happen to me. And then finally she says it in her last words. She says, And I beheld, and those who won the wall pass to such issue as the gods ordain. I too will pass, and like them, dare to die. She turns, she looks upon the...